Pennsylvania's Tree People of Tuscarora State Forest Written by Exitum Elements What if I were to tell you that when I was an 11-year-old boy, I came into contact with a lost humanoid creature that lived in the trees? If you decided to play along and act as though you believed me, you'd ask, and what country was this in that you saw this being? This is when I'd tell you that it was right here, in Pennsylvania, that I saw the bizarre creature of the backwoods. Now, if you're feeling extremely generous, you might nod your head and ask me to tell you how I happened upon a creature that no one has mentioned until now. And that's when I'd be forced to correct you. These creatures are mentioned all the time by hikers, campers, and backpackers. The people that visit the woods and stay late enough until it's dark. Murmurs of strange movements overhead and even the sightings of white figures in the distant treetops. Go online and you'll see people mention these beings in stray forum threads of discussions. Though often, these threads have a way of ending up locked. Though, compared to some of the internet posts, my interaction with these beings was a bit more dramatic. It was on a two-day backpacking excursion as a boy scout, with five other boys plus two scout leaders. One of those trips that would net us one patch or another to add to our sash. My backpack was impossibly heavy at the time, and I remember thinking that it would be much more fun to hike without the hefty load. Of course, that wasn't possible for such a trip as this. But as the first day went on, I realized that it wasn't so bad once you were in your groove. We all walked in single file between the large hemlocks and oaks and made our way three miles into the woods to the designated campsite. I was relieved when we had our break at the halfway point to the campsite. I took off my backpack, causing the sweat on my back to become even more apparent. Everyone found a suitable log or rock and sat down to nibble on their respective snacks, which consisted mostly of beef jerky and granola bars. As I sat there in the shade, our leader pointed up to the sky to show us an osprey who was fluttering around and crying out a mating call. I gazed out at the large bird. The other scout leader thought that it was a hawk, but the former leader declared that he could recognize the call of the osprey, which apparently was more distinct. I continued to look up while my eyes wandered over the treetops. It was then that I noticed a bright red bandana hanging high up in one of the oak trees. I wondered how it could have possibly gotten so high. I attempted to point it out to the leader who identified the osprey, but he wasn't especially interested since he was still making his case on the bird not being a hawk. Even though I could tell that he never actually set eyes on it, he explained it away by saying sometimes squirrels steal things and take them up into a tree. We continued onward after our short break. The path now took a more sloping and rocky form and we were told regularly to watch our steps. Despite the questionable footing, we managed to arrive at our campsite with no incidents. The campsite had a wooden shelter and a creek that could be heard nearby. We spent some time using the said water source to wash up and cool down before nightfall, when we eventually retired to our tents. Lying in my tent under the light of my headlamp, I fiddled with a Rubik's Cube until I was too tired to hold my eyes open, and eventually I put it down, rolled over, and shut my eyes. It was about then that I heard a rustling out in the woods. The thin tent walls made it apparent that the movement was too sporadic to be a fellow camper. My mind went to some small animal like a squirrel or a skunk, but when I heard the twigs break and branches bend, I began to think that something larger was out there. The leaders had bear-bagged our food for us and explained to us the importance of not keeping food in the tent. I suddenly became paranoid, as I had left gum in my backpack, and I wondered if it could bring a black bear roaming around. I laid there frozen, listening to the rustling. 
I noticed the sound had moved above ground level and sounded like it was in the trees. I was sure at this point that it had to be a black bear, scampering up the tree, perhaps attempting to reach our food. I realized I would have to look outside if I wanted to see what was making the noise. I finally unzipped my tent door as quietly as I could, and I peeked outside carefully so that I wouldn't be spotted by the woodland animal. I looked out and slowly scanned the trees trying to locate the black bear. Instead of a bear, I saw a ragged white sheet hanging from a branch about 30 feet up in a tree almost like someone had hung it out to dry. I watched it, slightly swaying in the breeze, until I noticed it wasn't swaying so much as swinging lightly. Then I realized that it wasn't a sheet at all. No, it was some type of humanoid creature, hanging from a branch. The form slowly became clear before my eyes as I stared. The long, wide arms dangled beneath its head as he swung on the tree branch by his legs. The swinging became much more animated until he had enough momentum to swing himself to another branch, grabbing it by his arms and working himself onto another leg hanging position. He was closer now, and the details of his face came into view. The brow had a protruding rig, and his eyes were large and solid black. The nose was inward, and basically only a slit while his mouth appeared to be perpetually opened, bearing his very human or maybe perhaps ape-like teeth, not unlike what you might see in a zoo from an orangutan. Also, I could tell it was male. His privates were on complete display with no clothing or fur to cover them. I couldn't see any pupils in his disc-shaped eyes although it was dark, so it's possible that they were there somewhere. But his face was pointing right in front of him when it suddenly turned its head to my direction. To this day, I'm not sure if he saw me, though it felt as though our eyes made contact. I crouched back into my tent and I zipped it up and laid on top of my sleeping bag, terrified. I wanted to cry out to one of the adults, but I worried that the creature would respond to my cries and get to me first. So, instead, I just laid there, breathing as quietly as possible and pretending that my tent walls would provide me protection. Eventually, I heard more rustling in the treetops that became fainter and fainter until I couldn't hear them at all. After it was silent, I somehow was able to fall asleep the next morning, I went out of the tent to relieve myself, far away from the campsite as we scouts were taught. When I came back to the campsite, I joined the others in preparing our freeze-dried foods, where the cooking consisted of pouring boiling water into a pouch. I sidled up to another scout named Billy that I sort of knew from school. I asked him if he had heard anything the previous night. He responded that he did hear some twigs cracking, but he knows that that's normal since he camps often with his dad. I thought about telling him what I saw, but I realized how ludicrous the sighting would sound. In any case, I decided an adult might be a more reliable source of information. I went to the Osprey scout leader and I asked him, Are there any monkeys or people that live in the forest here? He looked away from the hobo coffee he was working on, and with a quizzical look, he asked, Monkeys or people living in this forest? This isn't exactly the rainforest, buddy. Why do you ask? I looked around at the campsite again to see if anyone was listening in. I didn't want the other kids to hear and potentially make fun of me for seeing creatures in the forest. I said in a low voice, I saw a human-like guy, or a monkey. The face was strange. I don't know what it was, but he was hanging from a branch last night near our campsite. He was extremely pale. Pale, the leader responded. He didn't have any fur. He asked me. No, no fur, I told him. The leader looked at me in a troubling manner and then went to talk to the hawk leader. 
The hot guy eyed me while they chatted and then came over to me. Heard you saw something weird in the woods last night, he said. I recounted my story, and I went into more detail on how the creature's mouth looked with those large square teeth. He looked concerned and shot a look to the other leader before responding. Y you know, our eyes play tricks on you when you're out in the woods. You look into the dark and you can see things that aren't there. It happens to all of us. I remember one time waking up to a spider right in front of my face, and I shot out my hand so hard to smash it that I tore my tent door. Turns out it was just the frayed end of the zipper, he said. Also, the other leader continued, sometimes you can have a sleep paralysis fit or a dream and wake up the next day thinking it was real. It's something about hiking all day that makes you dream more. The hawk leader nodded in agreement, and I felt fairly hopeless at this point to prove that I had actually seen something, and I let it go. Despite the heat, later that day we started a fire. It's always fun to have a campfire at this age, and we were not about to let the fact that the temperature was in the 80s stop us. Also, the leaders brought marshmallows for everyone to roast. We picked out some roasting sticks, and I took a seat by Billy. We weren't really friends, but being the only two kids from our small school made us gravitate towards each other. Soon, it was time for us to go back to our tents and go to sleep so that we could wake up early enough to hike our way out of the woods and back to the trailhead. I went to my tent and considered what to do if I heard or saw the creature again. While laying there contemplating it, I sure enough heard more twigs bending and breaking. I looked out of my tent much faster this time, my curiosity overwhelming my fear. To my surprise, I saw Billy slowly making his way to the outskirts of the campsite. And then I heard unzipping and the familiar faint trickling sound of urination. I zipped up my tent and laid back down. But as soon as I did that, I heard more noises indicating movement in the woods though it was in the opposite direction of where Billy was currently located. I again unzipped my tent and looked outside again, half expecting at this point to see another scout making his way to the woods to relieve himself. When I couldn't spot anyone walking on the ground, I moved my eyes to the treetops, and sure enough, the tree creature was hanging in the tree, similar to the previous night, swinging lightly. I looked back in Billy's direction. He was looking straight at the tree creature and appeared to be frozen in fear. I thought about motioning to him, but I was worried that that would attract the creature to me. So I remained still. The tree creature swung himself to a nearby tree, making himself closer to Billy. I could only hope that this was not intentional and that he had not yet noticed the scout. The creature was still hanging from his legs when he brought his arms up and grabbed the branch with his hand and dropped his legs beneath him. He hung there from his arms for a moment before he dropped down to the ground, onto his feet, and stood there. His eyes were right on Billy. He looked odd standing on his legs, as though this posture was not natural for him. Nevertheless, he started to take slow, short strides towards Billy who continued to be frozen to the spot, petrified. As the creature slowly made his way towards him, Billy turned away from the creature and towards the campsite, but only managed to partially yell out before another tree creature appeared behind him and embraced him, covering Billy's mouth with his hands. The camp became alive with movement. Tents were unzipped and heads poked out. The two camp leaders looked out towards Billy and then ran towards him. However, before they could reach him, the two pale beings, one with Billy still in his grasp, moved surprisingly fast on their stubby legs back into the woods. One of the leaders followed in the direction that Billy had disappeared, hiking all night trying to find him, but to no avail. The next morning was a somber one. As far as the leaders were concerned, Billy was kidnapped by two nude white men and as quick as we could, we began hiking out of the woods. The march back to the trailhead 
was the most dismal moment of my life. Us scouts talked about who the men could be and why they were nude. But even in the bright daylight, the threat was still present, and talking openly about it was difficult. I could tell that everyone was scanning the surrounding woods, trying to catch either a glimpse of Billy's fate or the two people that took him coming back for more of us. Once we arrived at the trailhead, we were loaded back into the cars and we went straight to the police station. A police report was made and we were all questioned, especially me. I had seen the pale creature first and everyone was desperate to hear every piece of information that I could possibly share. However, when I described them with their long arms and disc-shaped eyes, the adults became more frustrated. The scout leaders had only seen a glimpse of the creature's backside. They didn't fully appreciate how primal they looked. My strange descriptions were chalked up to an active boy's imagination who was trying to make sense of a nude man in the woods. And no, Billy was never found. I wish there was a more satisfying ending to the story. I left the Boy Scouts after that incident, and I haven't been to any forest in Pennsylvania since then. However, I plan to change that and make a trip back to the same area. Once I muster up the nerve, I'll go to the same trailhead and to the same campsite and see if I can find any clues on what happened to Billy or catch another glimpse of the tree people of Tuscarora.